Hello and welcome to Vaichu's exam prep IAS. Welcome to the big news. The topic for today's discussion, Cyclone Mantis makes landfall. Before we understand what this topic is in greater detail, a quick gentle reminder. Vaichu's exam prep IAS has already launched its official telegram channel. If you have not yet joined the channel, please do join so that you get all the current affairs related updates. Let's get started and try and understand what is this topic all about. We have Cyclone Mandus which happens to be a severe cyclonic storm. This has emerged from the Bay of Bengal region and has made landfall in Mamlapuram which is about 30 km from Chennai. Now the first question is what is this landfall of a cyclone? When it comes to the tropical cyclones it is formed in the seas. It is formed over the water. So as it moves from the water wherever this cyclone hits the land wherever it falls wherever this particular cyclone the eye of the cyclone moves over the land that is what is called as landfall so the cyclone which is developed on the sea on the water makes its imprint on the land which is called as the landfall of a cyclone whenever we speak about the landfall of a cyclone this is where most of the damage occurs within a mature tropical cyclone so basically what we will see is strong winds that comes on shore and this will also result in heavy flooding rains in this part of the region so the landfall is a place where the cyclone which is developed over the sea falls that is it makes its imprint on the land and whenever it does so it results in excessive storm surge and at the same time it results in rain in that particular area now what we have to focus is on the course of the cyclone what is this course of the cyclone this is nothing but the journey of the cyclone as you can see the landfall was in mamlapuram but then it is moving upwards so the cyclonic storm mandus weakened into a deep depression over north tamil nadu coast it is now moving west northwestwards and gradually weakened into a depression by noon so this will move upwards this will move towards the northward direction it will move towards Andhra Pradesh and that is what is called as the course of the cyclone. Now what we have to focus is on the severity of the cyclone. As we initially discussed, it is a severe cyclonic storm. How is it divided? What we have is the type of disturbances and the wind speed. So it is called as low pressure. If the wind speed is less than 31 kilometers per hour, it is called as depression. If it is between 31 to 49 kilometers per hour, deep depression. If it is 49 to 61 kilometers per hour, cyclonic storm. If it is 61 to 88 kilometers per hour severe cyclonic storm if it is 88 to 117 kilometers per hour and super cyclone if it is more than 221 so in this image it goes on to say that it was formed as a severe cyclonic storm and now it is turned into a depression so as it moves northward it becomes a depression which means the wind speed would be between 31 to 49 kilometers per hour. Then we also have the cyclonic category as well, where it is called as one cyclonic category. If the wind speed is between 120 to 150 kilometers per hour, it is 2. If it is 150 to 180, 3. If it is 180 to 210, 4. If it is 210 to 250, and 5 if it is 250 and above. That is the naming convention that we have to remember. Who has given this name of Cyclone Mandus? Mandus is a name that is given by United Arab Emirates. It is Mandus pronounced as Mandos. So basically this was named by United Arab Emirates. It happens to be an Arabic word and this is nothing but treasure box. So as we have discussed in the past as well, when it comes to the naming, what we will have is the columns. So it will be Nisarga first, Gati second, Niva third, so on and so forth. And the next tropical cyclone will be Mocha. And after Mocha, what we will have is Beeper Joy followed by Tej, so on and so forth. What is the impact of this cyclone? Wherever the landfall has occurred in and around those regions, what we have seen is excessive rainfall. This has led to trees falling down, resulting in loss of property as well, suspension of the economic activities and when you consider Chennai which happens to be the capital of Tamil Nadu transport facilities are suspended electricity is suspended and the cyclone has created a havoc it has uprooted the trees as well and there is water logging in number of low-lying areas as well so places like Chennai 
Thiruvallar, Rajpet have started experiencing strong surface winds of 50 to 60 km per hour as well. In order to overcome all these issues, we have the government of India which has taken some of the measures. As many as 16,000 police personnel and 1,500 home guards have been deployed in the state for security, relief and rescue tasks and a 40-member team of Tamil Nadu State Disaster Response Force in addition to 12 disaster response force teams are on standby. Nearly 400 personnel of NDRF and State Disaster Response Force teams have been stationed in coastal regions including near the Kaveri Delta area. Barricades are also set up in the city to prevent motorists from getting closer to the potholes and other areas with high water stagnation. These are some of the measures taken by the government. Now why is the eastern coast always hit by the tropical cyclones in comparison? Why is the western coast not hit by the tropical cyclones? So what we have is the Bay of Bengal on the eastern side. What we have is the Arabian Sea on the western side. So in comparison of the Bay of Bengal and the Arabian Sea, the eastern coast as the western coast, we have more cyclones that are formed on the eastern coast in comparison to the western coast. Why is it? That is what we have to understand. More cyclones are formed in the Bay of Bengal than Arabian Sea due to wind patterns that keeps oceans cooler on the western side. Even among those formed along the western coast, many move towards Oman instead of hitting the Indian shores. The primary reason is we have number of rivers which come and fall into the Bay of Bengal region. We have Kaveri which falls here, we have Krishna here, we also have Ganga, Brahmaputra, all these rivers constantly bring fresh waters into this part of the region. So there is required temperature, there is required fresh water, this has added to the formation of the cyclones. So when you consider some of the eastern coast, that is the Bay of Bengal region, there is surface sea temperature, humidity, which is directly related to the formation of the cyclone. Since the Bay of Bengal receives high average rainfall, the possibility of cyclone formation is very high in this part of the region. Added to it, the winds over the Bay of Bengal are said to be more sluggish compared to the Arabian Sea and the winds fail to reduce the surface temperature of the sea, which is why there is predominant formation of cyclones in the Bay of Bengal region. What is the geographical advantage that Arabian Sea has? When you look at Arabian Sea, it has much calm winds in comparison to Bay of Bengal and added to it, whenever there are winds coming from the Pacific Ocean, these winds, when they approach, what they have is Western Ghats here. By the time they cross the Western Ghats, it is almost prevented by them, so the speed at which these winds come from the Pacific Ocean is far calmer on the Arabian Sea coast. So Arabian Sea enjoys the locational advantage as the winds from the Pacific Ocean encounter the Western Ghats cutting down on its intensity and even if they flow to the Arabian Sea, it is far more calmer as well. As far as Arabian Sea is concerned, another advantage is the number of rivers that flow into Arabian Sea is comparatively less in comparison to the eastern coast, which is why there is locational advantage. We have more cyclones that are formed in the eastern coast. What are the NDMA guidelines? If you look at the NDMA guidelines, they have said that establishing a state of art, early warning system involving observations, predictions, warnings and user-friendly advisories will have to be given to the people at the time of cyclone, commissioning of the National Disaster Communication Infrastructure to provide dedicated and fail-safe communications to the national state and disaster management authorities and officials concerned, expanding the warning dissemination, outreach by introducing last mile connectivity which will include providing public address system along the entire coastal line using the VHF technology, implementing the National Cyclone Risk Mitigation Project in all the 13 coastal states and union territories, management of coastal zones to include mapping and delineation of coastal wetlands, patches of mangroves and shelter bends and identification of potential zones for expanding bio-shield spread based on remote sensing tools, setting up of an exclusive ecosystem, monitoring network to study the impact of the climate change, establishing a comprehensive cyclone disaster management information system covering all phases of disaster management, setting up of a national cyclone disaster management institute in one of the coastal states to address all issues related to cyclone risk and commissioning of aircraft probing of cyclone facility 
to fill the critical observational data gaps and significantly reducing the margin of error in predicting cyclone track intensity and rainfall are some of the measures that have to be undertaken as part of the NDMA guidelines. It is this that we have to understand with respect to this topic. So this is it for today. Thank you for watching. All the best.